Revolution of Everyday Life by Raoul Vanagam. Vanagam. Chapter 5. The Decline and Fall of Work. The duty to produce alienates the passion for creation. Productive labor is part and parcel of the technology of law and order. The working day grows shorter as the empire of conditioning extends. In an industrial society which confuses work and productivity, the necessity of producing has always been an enemy of the desire to create. What spark of humanity, of a possible creativity, can remain alive in a being dragged out of sleep at six every morning, jolted about in suburban trains, deafened by the racket of machinery, bleached and steamed by meaningless sounds and gestures, spun dry by statistical controls, and tossed out at the end of the day into the entrance halls of railway stations, those cathedrals of departure for the hell of weekdays, and the nugatory paradise of weekends, where the crowd communes in weariness and boredom. From adolescence to retirement, each 24-hour cycle repeats the same shattering bombardment, like bullets hitting a window. Mechanical repetition, time which is money, submission to bosses, boredom, exhaustion. From the butchering of youth's energy to the gaping wound of old age, life cracks in every direction, under the blows of forced labor. Never before has a civilization reached such a, such a degree of contempt for life. Never before has a generation drowned in mortification felt such a rage to live. The same people who are murdered slowly in the mechanized slaughterhouses of work are also arguing, singing, drinking, dancing, making love, holding the streets, picking up weapons, and inventing a new poetry. Already the front against forced labor is being formed. Its gestures of refusal are molding the consciousness of the future. Every call for productivity in the conditions chosen by capitalist and Soviet economy is a call to slavery. The necessity of production is so easily proved that any hack philosopher of, of industrialism can fill ten books with it. Unfortunately for these neo-economist thinkers, these proofs belong to the 19th century, a time when the misery of the working classes made the right to work the counterpart of the right to be a slave, claimed at the dawn of time by prisoners about to be massacred. Above all, it was a question of surviving, of not disappearing physically, the imperatives of production are the imperatives of survival. From now on, people want to live, not just to survive. The trepalium is an instrument of torture. Labor means suffering. We are unwise to forget the origin of the words travail and labor. At least the nobility never forgot their own dignity and the indignity which marked their bondsmen. The aristocratic contempt for work reflected the master's contempt for the dominated classes. Work was the expiation to which they were condemned to all eternity by the divine decree which had willed them, for impenetrable reasons, to be inferior. Work took its place among the sanctions of providence as the punishment for poverty, and because it was the means to a future salvation, such a punishment could take on the attributes of pleasure. Basically, work was less important than submission. The bourgeoisie does not dominate. It exploits. It does not need to be master. It prefers to use. Why has nobody seen that the principle of productivity simply replaced the principle of feudal authority? Why has nobody wanted to understand? Is it because work ameliorates the human condition and saves the poor, at least in illusion, from eternal damnation? Undoubtedly, but today, it seems that the carrot of happier tomorrows has smoothly replaced the carrot of salvation in the next world. In both cases, the present is always under the heel of oppression. Is it because it transforms nature? Yes, but what can I do with a nature ordered in terms of profit and loss? in a world where the inflation of techniques conceals the deflation of the use value of life. Besides, just as the sexual act is not intended to procreate, but makes children by accident, organized labor transforms the surface of continents as a byproduct, not a purpose. 
work to transform the world? Tell me another. The world is being transformed in the direction prescribed by the existence of forced labor, which is why it is being transformed so badly. Perhaps man realizes himself in his forced labor. In the 19th century, the concept of work retained a vestige of the notion of creativity. Zola describes a nail smith's contest in which the workers competed in the perfection of their tiny masterpiece. Love of the trade and the vitality of an already smothered creativity incontestably helped man to bear 10 or 15 hours, which nobody could have stood if some kind of pleasure had not slipped into it. The survival of the craft conception allowed each worker to contrive a precarious comfort in the hell of the factory, but Taylorism dealt the death blow to a mentality which had been carefully fostered by by archaic capitalism. It is useless to expect even a caricature of creativity from the conveyor belt. Nowadays, ambition and the love of the job well done are the indelible mark of defeat and the most mindless submission which is why, wherever submission is demanded, the old ideological fart wends its way, from the arbeit mocked fray of the concentration camps to the homilies of Henry Ford and Mao Zedong. So what is the function of forced labor? The myth of power exercised jointly by the master and God drew its coercive force from the unity of the feudal system. Destroying the unitary myth, the power of the bourgeoisie inaugurated, under the flag of crisis, the reign of ideologies, which can never attain, separately or together, a fraction of the efficacy of myth. The dictatorship of productive work stepped into the breach. Its mission is physically to weaken the majority of men, collectively to castrate and stupefy them in order to make them receptive to the least pregnant, least virile, most senile ideologies in the entire history of falsehood. Most of the proletariat at the beginning of the 19th century had been physically enervated, systematically broken by the torture of the workshop. Revolts came from artisans, from privileged or unemployed groups, not from workers shattered by 15 hours of labor. Isn't it disturbing that the reduction of working time came just when the spectacular ideological miscellany produced by consumer society was beginning effectively to replace the feudal myths destroyed by the young bourgeoisie? People really have worked for a refrigerator, a car, a television set. Many still do, invited as they are to consume the passivity and empty time that the necessity of production offers them. Statistics published in 1938 indicated that the use of the most modern technology then available would reduce necessary working time to three hours a day. Not only are we a long way off with our seven hours, but after wearing out generations of workers by promising them the happiness which is sold today on the installment plan, the bourgeoisie, and its Soviet equivalent, pursue man's destruction outside the workshop. Tomorrow they will deck out their five hours of necessary wear and tear with the time of creativity, which will grow just as fast as they can fill it with the impossibility of creating anything, the famous leisure explosion. It has been quite correctly written. China faces gigantic economic problems. For her, productivity is a matter of life and death. Nobody would dream of denying it. What seems important to me is not the economic imperatives, but the manner of responding to them. The Red Army in 1917 was a new kind of organization. The Red Army in 1960 is an army such as is found in capitalist countries. Circumstances have shown that its effectiveness has been far below the potential of a revolutionary militia. In the same way, the planned Chinese economy, by refusing to allow federated groups to organize their work autonomously, condemns itself to become another example of the perfected form of capitalism called socialism. Has anyone bothered to study the modes of work of primitive peoples? The importance of play and creativity the incredible yield obtained by methods which the application of modern technology would make a hundred times more efficient. Obviously not. Every appeal for productivity comes from above, but only creativity is spontaneously rich. It is not from productivity that a full life is to be expected. It is not productivity that will produce an enthusiastic collective response to economic needs. But what can we say when we know how the cult of work is honored from Cuba to China and how well the virtuous pages of Guizot would sound in a May Day speech. 
To the extent that automation and cybernetics foreshadow the, the massive replacement of workers by mechanical slaves, forced labor is revealed as belonging purely to the barbaric practices needed to maintain order. Thus, power manufactures the dose of fatigue necessary for the passive assimilation of its televised, its televised dictates. What carrot is worth working for after this? The game is up. There is nothing to lose anymore, not even an illusion. The organization of work and the organization of leisure are the blades of the castrating shears whose job is to improve the race of fawning dogs. One day will, will we see strikers demanding automation in a 10-hour week, choosing instead of picketing to make love in the factories, the offices, and the culture centers? Only the planners, the managers, the union bosses, and the sociologists would be surprised and worried. Not without reason. After all, their skin is at stake.